Hey, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, how's everybody doing this weekend? Great. Are you, are you well-rested this morning? No. no. Okay. All right. Good. Good. You have a permission to nap or do whatever you want. All right. Good. Really glad you're here. Welcome to Foundations Church. Delighted that you're all here. Thank you. If you're a first-timer with us, that's always humbling to have a guest in our house that's never been here before. So go to the information booth. We have a little gift for you, just a way of saying thanks, okay? Re really glad you're here. As the video just showed, we're in this series called This Is Us, trying to talk about this amazing concept uh, of what, what we do, what, why we do this, why are we here. I mean, this is amazing if you think about it. The church existed, the Bible says, in the mind of God before the creation of the world. We're participating in something that's mind-blowing, as messy and as crazy and as flawed as the church is. This, is a, this, this thing existed in the mind of God years and years and years ago, and here we are in the 21st century participating in something that God thought of. It, it, it's mind-boggling. So last week we talked about, uh, we're looking at the first church in the, in the book of Acts, and, we, and last week we talked about... Um, uh, we talked about how the church started. Um, it, it started with a group of people who saw the resurrected Jesus. And we'll talk about that in a second. That, that our faith is not built on church. It's not built on the teachings of Jesus necessarily. It's not teached based on the Bible per se. It's based, our faith is based on an event that Jesus rose from the dead. He was seen by people, and the people who saw the resurrected Jesus became part of this thing called the church. Before that, it was called the way, and they revolutionized their world, and it reverberates all the way to the 21st century. It's an amazing thing. I challenge you today, if you don't know what your spiritual roots are, we're really glad you're here. I challenge you to check out every religion you can. Check it out. Find out what the truth is, and I will tell you what you will find, though. You will find the founder of every religion is laying in a grave except one religion. That's Christianity. The founder of Christianity's grave is empty. He predicted his death. He predicted his resurrection and pulled it off. That's a guy worth following. It's amazing. So that's right here. So here's how the church started. We talked about last week, it started by prayer. And we read this amazing prayer. We can go to the first slide. We, we, the first prayer is amazing. It was recorded in Acts 4, and we closed last week by reading that prayer together. I got the chills as we read that together because, be, because we were reading a prayer that they said 2,000 years ago that a guy who was in the room, Luke, recorded it, and we read it right out of Acts 4. It's amazing. It was a prayer for boldness. And we said, so we want to pray like that. So we said, take a bow. That's what we talked about last week. We said, pray. Pray how you usually pray. Oh, God, keep me safe. I need a lot of money. I hope my daughter doesn't marry that rat. You know, all those things, okay? Those are okay prayers. They're all usually about us, okay? But I, we asked you, we asked you, encouraged you to, to say this prayer, to take a bow at the end of all of our prayers that are mostly about us and say, hey, God, remind me that you're all powerful. That you're an all-powerful God. And that's important to remember because if you know that God's all-powerful, that means that whatever dilemma you're facing today, God is bigger than it. Bigger than any challenge you're facing, no matter how daunting it may seem. And then we prayed for boldness. Boldness. We said, come on, we, we want to be bold people because affluence and comfort are the enemies of boldness. And so as we live in this very affluent and very comfortable setting, in America here, we could eradicate the boldness. And we said, no, no, God's created us for something bigger than ourselves. So God, help me, help me, give, give me, give me boldness. And then we prayed that God would use ordinary people. I'm just an ordinary guy. And with no disrespect to anybody here today, I look out over the crowd and I see a lot of ordinary people. No disrespect. All right. Okay. But, but, but here's what the power of it. We're praying, Hey God, take ordinary people and do something extraordinary in and through us. We're not just here to play church. We're here to make a difference in the world. So God, use a tragically flawed person and use me in extraordinary ways. I don't want my kids to read about faith. I don't want my kids to hear about faith. I want my girls and my boys to see faith in their dad. I want people to drive by this building and say, the building's no big deal. It's an old movie theater. But you know what? There's something special. The people in there are pretty ordinary, but man, there's something different about those people because they're doing extraordinary things and they're pretty messed up because their God is pretty big. Are you all with me today? Not to hear about God, but to see God working in tangible ways in the 21st century. Thank you for the person in the back row who clapped for me, okay? I appreciate that, all right? Okay? And then we said pray for Windsor. 
Windsor. Well, I pray for Windsor. And we announced last week we're going to start, a, a, we're going to start another campus on Windsor, at Windsor, okay? So pray for Windsor. If you don't want to pray for Windsor, then pray for the world, okay? But we can't do anything unless we pray. Now, some business people, smart, smart, smart businessman, bought this building before we were even in it. He said, you need this building. I didn't think we did. He was smarter than me, and we needed it. So he bought it and held it for us. He got some people, I think, to help him. And, and it was condemned, so we really couldn't get in here. But what we did is we put a prayer calendar back when we were in Thompson Valley, and we had people come and walk around this building and pray. We tried to have, get people to pray for it every day. I had my day off. I had my day off. So I would come here on my day off. I'd get here in the morning before anybody else. There was no one here anyway. And then I would just walk around one time, sometimes two if I could make it, okay, all right? And, 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 I, and I'd pray for this building. And, and what, happened, what happened that we're in this building and, and the things that have gone on since that have all been a testimony, not to us at all, but a testimony that God answers prayer. So on the way out, we have a prayer wall back there, and it's about Windsor. So uh, we're asking our people, inviting you to pray for Windsor, okay? So if you work there, if you live there, if you know people there, you go into town there for whatever, um, uh, Stuffed Burger is in Windsor, okay? All right? Uh, and if you go there, we're asking you to sign up just to pray. And the building we have is, is right, right, right next to McDonald's, okay, right across the street from Windsor High School, and we want people, we're going to try to get people there every day to pray, because we know this, if God's not in it, then we're wasting our time, okay? We're not good enough, smart enough, quick enough to know anything, but God's bigger than all that, so we're asking you to, to say, hey, God, you're all powerful. Hey, 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 God, help us be bold. Hey, God, do, do, something, do something out of the ordinary through ordinary people, and then, God, we're praying that you could do something special in Windsor as, an, as a front range is exploding with people moving here. Now, we talked about the enemy of the church, so we give a visual. Here's the beginning. Anytime you want to do something big for God, you better expect opposition. It ain't clear sailing. There's opposition all the time coming at us, and we said the opposition of the church is for it to grow inward. To be worried about ourselves. Just, we just pray about ourselves, just care about ourselves. And God's mission is always the world. And so when I entered ministry, long time ago, somebody handed me this. It's called the parable of a lighthouse. I don't like reading in church, but just indulge me just for a second. It starts like this. On a dangerous sea coast, shipwrecks often occur. There was once a crude little life-saving station. The building was just a hut, and there's only one boat. And a few people who kept constant watch over the waters to see if they could search anybody. And they searched tirelessly night and day searching for lost people who were shipwrecked. Many lives were saved by this little wonderful station. So much so that it became famous. And some of those who were saved and other people started getting involved with the station. And to give it their time and money and effort for the work. New boats were bought and new crews were trained. And the life station grew. Oh, that's exciting. And some of the new members of the life-saving station were unhappy that the building was so crude and so poorly equipped. They needed a more comfortable place that would be provided as a first refuge from those saved from the sea. So they replaced the emergency cot with beds, put in better furniture, made the building bigger. And now the life-saving station became a popular gathering place for its members, and they redecorated beautifully and furnished it. So less work now was being in, less work was going into saving people on the life, on the sea. Now they were focusing on just coming there and having a good time. And the mission of the life-saving uh, mission uh, just got lip service. Most people were too busy and didn't have the necessary commitment to take part in the life-saving activities themselves. About this time, a large ship was wrecked off the coast, and the hired crews brought in boats of cold, wet, and half-drowned people. The people they brought in were dirty, and they were sick. Some of them had black skin, and some of them spoke a strange language, and the beautiful new club was considerably messed up with dirt and mud, water. So the property trustee property committee immediately had a shower house built outside the club where victims of shipwrecks could be cleaned up before they came inside the club. At the next meeting, there was a split in the membership. Most of the members wanted to stop the club's life-saving activities as unpleasant and a hindrance to the normal pattern of the club. But some of the members said, no, we're here to save lives. And finally, they got voted down and told if they wanted to go save lives of, of people who were shipwrecked, they could begin their own life-saving station down the coast. And so they did. And as the years went by, the new station experienced the same change that occurred in the old one. And they evolved into another club. And yet another life-saving station was found. Last sentence. So if you visit the seacoast today, you'll find a number of exclusive churches, 
sorry, a number of exclusive clubs along that shore. Shipwrecks are still frequent in those waters. Only now, most people drown. And I want to tell you what we are. We're a life-saving station. We go out and try to find dirty, messed up, screwed up people, and our job is to bring them to Jesus so he could clean them up, not us. One, too many, one suicide in Larimer County is too much. One person OD'd in Larimer County is too much. One divorce is too much. Are you all with me today? We are committed to being a life-saving station. That's what we're to be about, okay? It's not... This is, this is never going to be an exclusive club just for us. So, hey, welcome to the Foundations, everybody. Okay, good. All right, we're really glad you're here. We're going to look at the first church and find out the strategy. First, God had people pray, and now we're going to find out the strategy that God used to change the world. And we're going to try to find out what that strategy is, because the same strategy he used 21 centuries ago is the same strategy he uses today to make a difference in this world, and I think he's asking some of us to do that. So I'm really glad you're here. Welcome. Let's all stand together. I'm going to have you look at a few verses, okay? The church started... The church started in Jerusalem. They were doing dynamic things. They were doing all kinds of things. It was started by people who saw the resurrected Jesus, and all of a sudden it started, and so here's what happened. Here's what happened. Here's what happened. <laughs> people started coming to this new thing called the way. They didn't have buildings back then. They didn't have pastors back then. They just gathered together. How many people came to this first church? Crowds, crowds came from the villages around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and all the possessed by evil spirits. And they were all what? Healed. Healed. And this thing started growing and growing and growing. And Jerusalem was bustling. Some people say a tenth of the population of Jerusalem was filled with people called the way. But God is interested in Jerusalem. But he's not just interested in Jerusalem. God said, go into all the But sometimes when you're comfortable, you don't want to be bold. And so sometimes God has to force people to be bold. And so guess what happened to the way? A great wave of? God allowed persecution. Hey, guys, don't focus on yourselves. you got to focus on this big world. You're a life-saving station. A great wave of persecution began that day, sweeping over the church in, in Jerusalem. So all the believers except the apostles were what? Scattered. They had to leave. They had to leave. Some had to go to Colorado Springs. Some had to go to Kansas. The real bad ones had to go to New Mexico. Okay, all right. It's scattered. It's scattered. Okay. Oh, no, go back just for a second. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And and, and they went through all the regions of Judea and Samaria. And God used persecution to have the message go out. Now we'll go to the next one. And and, And then this guy named Stephen, they arrested Stephen. They couldn't arrest an apostle. They wanted to stop this movement. But if you arrested an apostle, that was too politically risky. So they arrested a guy who was under the apostles. They called him a deacon. His name was Stephen. And Stephen preached this amazing sermon. But when they arrested him, they go, what do you have to say for yourself? And he preached this amazing message. You could look at it in Acts chapter 7. But he was so powerful. He was such a powerful order that the people who were against him hated him. And so what they did, and now we want to go back to the first century church, kind of, but we don't want to do this. The sermon they didn't like, and so they killed Stephen. We're discouraging that today, okay? Okay, we don't, we don't want to go there today, okay? So they, took, so they didn't like the sermon, and so the Bible says they stoned him. That needs some explanation in Colorado, okay? So they took, they, so, so they, so they took rocks and, and, and killed him. They killed him, and he became the first what they call martyr, a person who died for what they believed, and he was the first martyr of the early church at that time was called the way. And while they killed him, uh, there was this guy named Saul uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill all the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest and requested letters, saying, I want to go to every, from synagogues, I want to go to Damascus, the capital of Syria, and I'm asking for cooperation in the arrest of any followers of, wasn't called the church, and it was called the way. And I'm going to find him, and when he found him, he said, I'm going to bring him back, both men and women. I'm going to bring him back to Jerusalem in chains. I want to shut this movement down. That's what I want to do. I want to shut this movement down. And so he went to Damascus to shut the church down. But be careful what you do, because God has plans that are bigger than yours. 
And so on the way to Damascus, God met Paul. Can I ha- uh, how are your ankles doing? One more, one more verse can I show you before you sit down? I know you don't have an hour of sleep to deal with it, okay? All right? Okay, okay, here we go. One more. But the Lord said, he said this to a guy who's going to help Paul. Paul, he goes, go for Saul, the guy who's trying to shut the way down. He's a chosen instrument. Don't you ever think you're beyond God's reach? You might be God's chosen instrument. He says, I'm going to use this guy who's trying to shut down and kill the way. I'm going to use him. Take my message. He's going to take my message to the Gentiles. This isn't just for Jews. It's not just for Jerusalem. I'm going to take the Gentiles. It's not just for poor people and those who are oppressed. I'm going to take it to kings. I'm going to take it to all the people of Israel. And I will show him how he must suffer for my name's sake. And Paul, God used Paul dynamically. I don't think there's any single person in the church who changed the world more than the Apostle Paul. The guy who was committed to shut it down was the one who God changed his life, changed his heart, and used him in such a transformative way that he changed the world through the guy who wanted to shut the movement down. Okay, I'm tired. Okay, so we're going to talk about that today. Again, really glad you're here. Let's ask God to help us. But Join me in a word of prayer. Father, thank you. I'm humbled to be in this position. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the privilege I have and for the support and love of so many people. Um, I'm honored uh, just to be able to be part of this wonderful group of people. And we're not here for ourselves. We're here because you have bigger ideas and bigger plans for us. And so today I pray that uh, you would open up our hearts and our minds to what might be. Deliver us from what is. And help us see what might be. And uh, help us, Father, to be open to what you want to do. You used a guy who was a murderer and wanted to shut down the church, and you used him to build the church. Who knows what you might want to do through people in this room. So may we be open to your Spirit's work in our life. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. You may grab a seat. I'm really glad you're here. Here's God's strategy for reaching the world. Bold prayers, bold prayers, big prayers, big prayers. God, 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 it starts with prayer. We have to ask God, come on, God. It's not my will, but your will be done. And God's will is always bigger than ours. And so we have to pray for bold prayers. I, I, I ask you to pray bold prayers for your marriage. Bold prayers. I ask you to pray bold prayers for your children. Not just, oh God, I hope they make it. Bold prayers. Bold prayers. If you ever think of this church, pray bold prayers. Bold prayers for our lives. And that's how God's strategy. And the second strategy he uses is he uses magnificent and messy people. Beautiful and broken people. Fantastic and flawed people. That's what God does. That's what God does. He took, he took Paul and he says, man, what a, what a messy person this guy is. He says, but, I, but I, I'm going to use this guy because I, I want him to know that no matter how messy his life is, no matter how screwed up he is, no matter how much garbage he's carrying, that none of that garbage is greater than God's grace to clean up and to use. I want to know this morning, how many messy people do we have in the room? Can I see your hands? Okay. That's good news. That's good news. Now, let me tell you something about your messiness because it's messy. But let me tell you about messiness. Here's what I want you to know. Don't ever let your messiness get in and get in the way of your magnificence. Every person here is stamped with the image of God. And I run into messy people who think they're worthless and think they don't matter and think that God can't use them. And the messiness gets in the way of their magnificence. One of the saddest experiences I had was about three weeks ago, a guy just got released from prison, came to see me in my office. He was a preacher's kid. Boy, did he have a story. And his story was sordid and his story was difficult and broken and awful and the betrayal and the lies and the abuse in his life was staggering. And he's telling me his story. He's telling me his story. Tears form in his eyes and as he's telling the story, I see this beautiful heart from a very broken man and I start having tears in my eyes and when he finished his story, he looked up at me and he says, Pastor, I'm just here for one, for one reason, that's all I want to know, I just want to ask you one question. I go, what is it? And he goes, Pastor, can, can, can God still use me? And it broke my heart. That's an indictment on the church that somehow we've communicated to people that sometimes you can get so messy that God can't use you, and that's a lie from the pit of hell. 
I looked at that guy, and with tears in my eyes, I said, I think God can use you more now than he ever has in your past. Your messiness is going to be a message for the world because I see your magnificence. Your brokenness is beautiful, and God can use it. Here's the good news for messy people in this room today. Your mess is exactly what God wants you to have because that's who God uses, and his grace is greater than all of our sin. And I want every... And I want, every, I want every messy person to know that you're stamped with the image of God and you're magnificent. Do we have any magnificent people in the room? Can I see your hands? Okay, good. I like that. Good. Most of these people, some of you are deluded, but some of you have, some of you, have you know, big biceps and steel abs. You know, you got your house on the lake and you came here in your Lexus and I'm really glad that you're magnificent and you got lots of money and I'd like to talk to you after the service. But, but here's... But here's what I want you to know, because I used to be very, very, very intimidated. I come from a blue-collar home, and uh, we were taught we were less than until I found the grace of God. But, uh, but, uh, but I want to talk to you magnificent people for just for a second, because I met magnificent people, and I was intimidated by them. But here's what I found out about magnificent people, that if you scratch just a little bit below the surface, and usually it doesn't take much, behind that magnificence, you'll find a mess. So for you magnificent people, we love you, but I want you to know this. Don't think that your magnificence is bigger than God's grace and his plan for your life. Are you all with me? You're a mess too, and that's who God uses, magnificent and messy people, to bring a difference to, to, bring a difference to this world. And that's what he did. He used Paul. And so the apostle Paul found God's grace, and God took a, mag, a very messy person and used his magnificence. And Paul started out in Jerusalem. He took three missionary journeys, and he went around talking about this message, which we'll talk about in a second. And he went to Cyprus, and he went to modern-day Turkey and went to all these towns. He went to Antioch and Iconium and Lystra and Derbe. And he went to Ephesus and Pergamum. And he went to all these places. And he, thought, and he, started, he started little groups of the way, the way, the way, the message, the way, the way, the way, the message. And he was going. And then he went over to Greece. And he went up to Philippi and Thessalonica. Went to the intellectual capital of the world, Athens. And then from Athens, he went to maybe the commercial capital of the world, Corinth, because all the goods flew through this isthmus here. And Corinth was a very, very happening town, very cosmopolitan. He went there, and everywhere he went, he talked about the message of Jesus, and he took this very, very messed up guy and used his magnificence in a powerful way and changed the world around the Mediterranean, around the Mediterranean Sea. Paul would get arrested in Jerusalem. We'll talk about that in a second. And then he would go all the way to the capital of the Roman Empire, Rome. And there in Rome, he would preach about the message right in the capital, right in the teeth of the capital. And they put him in jail, and he would write a lot of the Bible in the jail. And then uh, Nero, Nero, the mighty, mighty, mighty man of, of paganism of the Roman Empire, Nero was so intimidated by this country hick named Paul that Nero cut off Paul's head. And there's no one there around. No, no one was there around to, to know. We don't even have it really described in the Bible at all. This powerful man, Nero, cut off Paul's head. And then a couple of years later, Nero would commit suicide. And today in the 21st century, people name their sons Paul and their dog's Nero. <laughs> and if your name is Nero, I'm sorry. Okay, but anyway, uh, okay, okay. And, so, so, and, and that's what Paul did. It, it, was, it was an amazing thing. And, and Paul said this. He was writing a letter to his protege, Timothy. His, Timothy was a younger guy, and he was, he was going to be a pastor, and Timothy was a timid guy. Good news for all of you who are timid today. All of you who are timid, uh, I, I want you to know that uh, Timothy was a timid guy. Uh, on, on the way out, I forgot to mention this, so I'll mention it right now. On the way out, because I want everyone to be bold, I have these black wristbands. I want you to pick one up. On it, it says uh, a bow. Take a bow. God's all powerful. Be bold. Help me do uh, out of the ordinary things. And W for Windsor or the world. A bow. And then on the other side, it says be bold. Now, I put all this black on black so we're not too bold. Okay? We don't want people at work to say, what are you wearing that for? Oh, I go to church. Okay, that's too risky. Way too risky for you guys. Okay, all right? So we're going to just take one step at a time. Black on black. What do you got there? Oh, just a black neck. Okay, whatever. Bracelet. Okay, all right? And so you can pick one up, and I want you to wear this until Easter. Five weeks. Wear this until Easter. Okay, just wear And it's just going to remind me to be bold. I got mine on already. Just be bold. Okay, just be bold for five weeks. Just say, okay, God, help me in this situation. I'm at a restaurant. I'm with my family. I'm at the workplace. Just be bold. Not, queer, not crazy, not creepy, not weird. Just be bold. 
in a very gracious way, okay? I want us to be bold people. Some guy on the way out says, don't you think this should have been in red? I go, well, maybe so. He goes, isn't it contradictory to be bold and black on black? Well, maybe so, one step at a time, folks, okay, all right? So pick one up, one per person on the way out, okay? And Paul said this to Timothy, who was a timid guy. Here's what he says, you read the yellow. This is a trustworthy saying and? So who should accept this next statement? Everyone. And here's what Paul said boldly. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Let me say it one more time, okay? Okay, here's what everyone should accept. Everyone should accept this statement. Sinner means you missed the mark. No one here is hitting a bullseye. That's what a sinner means. You're missing the mark. And here's what, here's what the Apostle Paul says. He says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Patronizing. I don't like it. Okay. All right. All right. Save sinners. You know what? And, 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 and we need to do a better job at that message because like if someone invites me over to their house or maybe I'll get invited to a golf course of golf. Course, and as soon as people find out that I'm a pastor, they change. They hide their shot glasses, you know, hide their cigarette. Oh my gosh, this is pastor. And, and, and I realize that's an indictment on the church because they think the presence of a church person means they're going to be condemned. I say to that, that's a lie from the pit of hell. Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world. Jesus came into the world to save the world from the condemnation. That's what he came for. And so he says this, hey, here's a message that everyone, everyone, and everyone means who? Everyone should accept this, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Then he says this, and I am the worst of them all. The one version says, I'm the chief of sinners. Chief means that if you were to have a start a single file line, if you were to start a single file line with sinners, chief means the guy who's at the front of the line would be the Apostle Paul. In other words, when, one, when God wanted to start his work of the way, he looked for the worst sinner of all, the chief of sinners, and said, hey, you're the man, you're the chief of sinners. Why did God do that? Because there's some people in the room today who think, I'm so screwed up, so messed up, I've been so taken advantage of, I've been raped, I've been broken, beaten, fired, stabbed in the back, betrayed, I'm so messed up that God can't use me. And God says this in a kind way, oh, get over yourself. You're not half as bad as the Apostle Paul. If you're sitting here saying, oh, I'm too bad, God can't use me, take a look at the front of the line, and then you'll see the Apostle Paul. He's the chief of sinners, and God rocked the world through him. Are you all with me? Everyone should know this statement. So how, how, how do we do this? What, what's God's strategy for reaching the world? Here we go. God's strategy is using magnificent and messy, beautiful and broken, gifted, and garbage people. So he uses, guided by God's GPS system. God's got a GPS system. Oh, I know you do. I want to be successful. I want this. Then I'm going to get promoted. My kid's going to go to Stanford. Then this is going to happen. And then I'm going to retire in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Okay? All right, uh, uh, Thermopolis, Wyoming. Oh, no, we're going the wrong direction. Okay, All right, so, so the GPS system, God's GPS system, it's different than yours. We think we have a plan, but God's plan is a lot different than ours. So how does the GPS system work? Let's explain that, then we'll go, okay? G, G stands for this. G stands for grace. G stands for what? Grace. grace. God's grace. God's grace. Here's what Paul said. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. I want you to know today that there's nothing good in this man standing in front of you. The only reason, and I cling to this, the only reason I could stand here today is because of the grace of God. I am what I am because of the grace of God. I'm not what I used to be because of the grace of God. And if you don't like me today, that's okay. I ask you to be patient because I'm not who I'm going to be by the grace of God. Are you all with me today? Paul says, I'm not, uh, I am what I am only by the grace of God. And his grace was not without effect. It had a work, it worked on me. It worked harder than all of them, but the grace of God, but, but the grace of God 
that was with me, that, that, that's what changed me. My, 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 uh, I, got, I got accepted. To, I, my first church had me coming. I was 28 years old. I was too, I was too, uh, I was too young. And I came from a really blue-collar family that was very broken, very angry, and drank all the time. So my mom and dad, who very, very, very rarely left Cleveland, Ohio, drove all the way to Iowa to watch me get what they call installed as a pastor of the church. And that was unusual, because my parents, it was we were broken and messed up people, and there's their son. A month later, my brother, who's older than me, very popular back in my hometown in Ohio, he opened up a bar, very popular bar. And my parents said, are you, coming home, are you coming home for Larry's open house? I said, I guess we will support my brother. And so I drove all the way home to support my brother's open house of this big bar in town. I was in the backyard, and Mr. Mulvahill's our neighbor. Mr. Mulvahill's our neighbor. Mr. Mulvahill says, hey, can you come here, Carl? Good to see you. I go, yeah, great to see you, Mr. Mulvahill. He goes, your mom and dad saw you go. To, yeah, I go, they saw you be past. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes, and, and, and tonight's your brother's open house at the bar. I go, yeah. He goes, can I ask you a question? I go, sure. He goes, I'm puzzled. Can you explain your family to me? <laughs> <clears throat> I really can't, Mr. Mulvahill. No, that's beyond explanation. <laughs> but I was only 28 at the time. I go, what do you mean? He goes, I, I just don't get it. I don't get it. Like, your, 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 your brother, your oldest brother was sentenced to prison. Larry's opening up a bar and you're a pastor. Can you explain that to me, Mr. Mulvahill? I cannot. It's the grace of God which defies explanation. The grace of God will wreck and disrupt your life that will defy any reason or explanation. Are you all with me today? That's what the Apostle Paul is saying. It's the grace of God. Now let's go to the next one. And he says this, the grace of salvation has appeared that offers salvation to all people. No matter how messy you are, God's grace paves a way for you to accept it and go to heaven. No matter how messy you are. So God's grace offers salvation and it what? Teaches us to say what? No to ungodliness and worldly possessions and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age. So God's grace will save you and God's grace will snatch you. It'll teach you to say no. When I went away to college, I, I became a Christian at the age of 17, went to Valparaiso University, a Lutheran college in Indiana. I didn't know anybody there, didn't know a single soul. Freshman orientation, a whole week of campus with just freshmen there. I sat in a room scared, confused, hoping people liked me, hoping I'd be caught, caught up, and I hope people would like Carl. No one knew me. And I sat in this room, and we were all talking, where are you from, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden, someone took out a joint, marijuana. It was illegal back then, okay? And all of a sudden, he started passing it around started passing around. I go, uh-oh, what am I going to do? Uh-oh, what am I going to do? Uh-oh, what am I going to do? I want to be liked by people. I don't want to be a weirdo. I want to be liked. This is my new, uh, this is a new beginning for me. Come on, what should I do? And, he, and then all of a sudden, passed around and started coming to me. And all of a sudden, I got up and said, hey, guys, I got to go. And I walked out of the room. You know what got me out of the room? The grace of God, which made me say what? No, no say no. no. Say no. no. Sometimes God's grace will tell you to say no. Hey, Sutter, let's go out and bomb to no not going to god's grace teaches us as we walk with him to say no to stuff that's not good for our life are you all with me god's grace will save you god's grace will snatch you talking to a guy in loveland not too long ago he told me that he went with a group of his buddies they're very well to do they went to las vegas to this show or whatever they were doing some stuff and then that night they went to a strip joint and uh he went to the strip joint with everybody and they were all drinking and having fun and all of a sudden one of the women walked, walked up to my buddy, and he, she asked him this question. Listen to this question she asked him. Hey, sir, are you looking for a night off from your marriage? Now, that's an interesting question. I'd like to break that question down, but we don't have time. Because truth be told, there's not a married couple in here <laughs> who at one time or another wanted to take a night off. Or a couple. Or a week from your marriage. He said, as soon as she said those words, his heart said, I love my wife and I love my kids. And he got up and he walked out of the strip joint. You know what got him out of the strip joint? Grace. The grace of God snatched him right out of the strip. Are you all with me today? God's grace will save me and God's grace will snatch me and help me grow. It teaches me to get better and better and better. So G stands for what? Grace. 
grace, God's grace, whatever happened in your life, if, you're, if, you're war, if your journey has taken you on a detour, like, hey, this isn't where I'm supposed to be. Maybe you're operating on the wrong GPS system. In the moment where you're at, God has grace for you. P stands for this, promises of God, the promises of God. The prom- I'm inviting everybody in our church this year, it's already March, to read the New Testament. 260 chapters, you can read the New Testament. You can read the New Testament. You can read it. It's easy. Some chapters are very small. You can read it. And if you don't like to read, listen to it. This is, because here's what I want you to know in the New Testament. God has all of his promises. One of his promises is this. One of his promises is that you're an heir. You're an heir of God. If you're an heir, what are you entitled to? Everything is inheritance. So you need to know what his inheritance is. So here's what the Apostle Paul says. Apostle Paul in St. Corinthians says this. For all means what? All of God's have been fulfilled in Christ. All of them. You don't have to work for any promise. You don't have to be good for a promise. You don't have to work for a promise. They've all been fulfilled in Christ. Watch this. With the resounding... Yes, and through Christ, our amen, which also means yes. yes. So every time you find out a promise to God and go to him through Jesus, God's answer is what? Yes. No, it isn't. Pay attention. It's, it's yes, yes. Are you all with me? It's yes, yes. It's a double yes. So this week I had a hard week. And so I got up so often, almost every night this week, 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, walk out to the living room, my stomach was just, ah, I'm in anxiety. Oh, God. Oh, God. I think I'm spinning. I think I'm heading for depression. Ah, ah, God, God, God. I'm heading for depression. God, I need some joy. Can you give me some joy? And his answer is? Yes, yes. yes. Oh, God. Come on, get with it, people. Okay? Oh, God. My daughter, and you heard about this, my daughter and grandson, cancer, all that. They're trying to come through all that. It's hard. God, oh God, our family needs some peace. God, can you give our family some peace? Yes, yes. yes, yes. Oh God, I'm about to get laid off. I'm about to lose my job. I'm about this. I don't know what's going to happen. Life is too scary. I am falling into despair, into the dark hole of despair. Oh God, I need some hope. God, can you give me some hope? His answer is Oh, God, this world's beating me up. It's crushing me. I don't think I could take it. Temptation's on every side. I'm trying to stay strong. I don't know if I can stay strong. Oh, God, I need some power. I need some power that's bigger than me. Hey, God, can I have power that's bigger than me? He says, oh, God, I feel so alone. My spouse died. I'm alone. My dog died. Oh, God, I'm getting old. I'm all alone. I think I'm all alone. I think I'm going to die because of loneliness. Hey, God, can you be with me? I need your presence. God, can you be with me? His answer is? Yes. Yes. That's why I want you to read the New Testament so you can know his promises because when you stand on his promises, you have a life that's unshakable. Unshakable. The world may shake it. Your GPS system may be faulty, but God's isn't because He's given you G, which stands for what? P, that stands for what? And S stands for this. He stands with me. No matter what happens, He stands with me. Okay, follow this very carefully. Here we go. Follow this very carefully. Paul said, I want to go to Jerusalem. I want to go to Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem's this way. I'll set my heart on Jerusalem. I want to go to Jerusalem. I want to go to Jerusalem. I want to go to Jerusalem. So his boat lands in Syria. Watch what happens. We found a shore. We, so Paul, Luke is with him. Found, we went to the local believers and stayed with them for a week. These believers prophesied through the Holy Spirit, prophesied through the Holy Spirit that Paul should. I want to go to Jerusalem. Don't go. He goes to another place. And several days later, a man named Agabus, who had the gift of prophecy, woo, arrived from Judea. He came over, took Paul's belt took Paul's belt off, and then he bound Paul's feet with the belt, and then he bound his hands with the belt. So he's bound with his, by a belt with his hand. Then he said, the Holy Spirit, the Zagab was saying, the Holy Spirit declares, Paul, the owner of this belt, who's the owner of this belt? Paul, be bound by Jewish leaders. If you go to Jerusalem, you're going to be bound and arrested. Oh, oh, oh. Next one, next one. And then when, he, when we heard this, Luke was with this other group, we and the local believers all begged Paul not to go to, 
Paul said this, I want to go to Jerusalem, 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 I want to go to Jerusalem. One guy said, don't go. Prophet said, don't go. Another group said, don't go. What did Paul do? He went to Jerusalem. Now the question is, should he have gone? And there's a big debate among theologians. Some say Paul was absolutely disobedient. Because what people predicted to happen to him, happened to him. He did get arrested. Other people says, no, he, he just did what he got. And so there's debate. Where do I stand under debate? My answer is, I don't know. I don't know if he should have gone, or I don't know if he didn't, shouldn't have gone. Should have gone or shouldn't have gone. I don't know. But I kept reading, and then I read this verse, and I started crying. This is later on, two chapters later. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul in Jerusalem and said, take courage. Are you all with me? Here's what I know. I don't know if Paul should have gone or shouldn't have gone. I know that he did go, and here's what I know. The Lord stood with him. Are you all with me today? Now, when I moved here, I was flat broke. I couldn't afford a thing. I had no job. And I was getting rejected. Midlife, trying to reinvent my life, that's a hard thing to do. Really tough. And I lied. I lied to my wife. I didn't want to, but I did, because she came to me one time. We had no money, and she had tears in her eyes, and she hugged me, and she goes, are we going to make it, Carl? Have you ever lied and you didn't want to lie? Are we going to make it? i like, we'll make it. And I had no clue that we were going to make it. So I saw this thing, because I used to do some stuff in the business world. So I saw this opportunity that you could buy into this thing, and it would provide you with some stuff. And it cost $25,000. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. And back then to us, it was a mountain of money. So I went to my wife, look at this. I could make this happen. This could be lucrative for us. I think I should do this. And she said, no, you know her so well. Okay, no. Okay. I said, no, but I want to do this. I want to do this. And so I called up my buddy who knows me. He lives on the East Coast. I said, I want this opportunity. It's, it's important to me. I'm trying to reinvent my life. And he says, well, let me fly out and spend some time with you. He flew out on his own nickel, came out and spent three days with me, looked at the opportunity, talked to me, thought about it, prayed about it. He looked at me and says, don't do it. Don't do it. You shouldn't do it. I wanted to do it. My wife said no. He said no. We prayed about it, and I wanted to do it. So I found 25. We didn't have 25, so I had to get it from different sources and leveraged everything I could to get 25, and I did it. I did it because I needed to reinvent. I was desperate. I did it. And guess how much money I made from that $25,000? I wish my church had more confidence in me, seriously. I mean, that hurts when you answer so quickly. Zero. I was like, well, <laughs> seriously, I want to talk to you after church, all right? Zero. You made nothing. And that's absolutely the truth. I made nothing. And for years, I felt really guilty about that. I really did. Still sometimes can wrestle with it. I started feeling guilty about it until I read this passage. Because my personal GPS system, and certainly my wife's, GPS system, says that was an abject failure. Should I have done it? I don't know. I get emotional about this, but here's what I do know. That today I stand before you, and the Lord stands with me. Are you all with me today? 25 grand less, he stands with me. And here's why I want to say that, because there are some people here who think you've really blown it, blew up your family, blew up your career, blew this up, blew this up. But here's what I want you to know. The Lord is standing with you. He's with you right now. Don't you dare, dare, dare undercut how important his presence is in your life. So I don't know if I did the right thing. I don't know if I did the wrong thing. But here's what I do know, that the Lord is with me saying, take courage, Carl, move on. Are you all with me today? So here's what we're armed with. Here's what we're armed with. We're armed with God. This is GPS system. Wherever you go, hey, I never thought I'd end up in Colorado. Well, here you are, because God's grace is with you. His promises are with you, and he's standing with you right now. He's standing right with you, okay? He's standing with you. So Paul says, I didn't think I'd end up here, but he did. I didn't think I'd end up here, but he did. I didn't think I'd end up in jail, but he did. And God used the jail to kind of write the New Testament. It's unbelievable. Oh, man, I didn't think I'd be in this kind of relationship. You are. I didn't think my marriage would look like this. It does. I didn't think my kids would be crazy. They are, okay? Well, I don't know about stuff. Why is this, okay? They are, okay? And God can use all of that by his GPS system, his grace, his promises, his presence standing with you. He says, take that. And then he says this, now we're done. The message, here's the message he says, okay? First Corinthians 15, he says, now let me remind you, brothers and sisters of the good news. The good news is gospel, same word. Good news, gospel, same word. 
I preached to you before. And you welcomed it, and you stand firm in it. That's a promise. Every time my world gets knocked around, I could stand in the good news. God's grace, God's promises, his presence is with me. I got I could stand in it. I could stand in it. He says, good news saves you if you continue to believe the message. And then he, then he goes on and says this. Here's what he says. I passed on to you what is most important. Say most important. Most important. I passed on to you what's most important. And was passed on to me. Now here's what Paul is saying. I want you to hear this. This was passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried. Hey, folks, what do you bury? Yeah. Stuff that's dead. If it's not dead, you don't bury it. Jesus was dead. Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He was raised on the third day, and he was seen. He was seen by Peter. He was seen by the 12 apostles. After that, he was seen by 500 more of his followers at one time. And many of them are still alive. He's writing to the way, the church in Corinth, in Corinth and saying this. Hey, I'm not hocus pocus stuff. This isn't blind faith. Ah, this is built on the testimony. Jesus died, rose again. He, and then he rose and he appeared. Peter saw him. I saw him. James, the brother of Jesus, saw him. 500 people saw him. And if you don't believe it, you could still drive to Jerusalem right now and you'll find people who were there. Christianity is not hocus pocus. Christianity is built on a testimony of people who actually saw the resurrected Jesus and went to their graves, sometimes being tortured, saying, I saw it. You can't stop my belief in that. And then he says this. So that's what I want you to know. And so here's the good news. Here's the message. We'll go to the next one. And then here's the good news. Four things. You read it. Number one. Number two. Number three. Number four. This is most important. What about baptism? I don't know. Figure it out. <laughs> what about prayer? I don't know. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, it seems. What about church? Church is crazy. I don't know. What about denominations? What about speaking in tongues? What about this? What about that? I don't know about a lot of that stuff. And I study it, and I still don't know. Here's the most important. Here's the most important. This is the message that changed the world. Most important. Number one, Jesus died for our sins. Number two, he was buried. Number three, he rose from the dead. And that's just not hocus pocus, hopeful belief. Number four, he was seen by a lot of people. And those people who saw him pray and went to their death proclaiming that truth. Jesus, number one, died for our sins. He was buried, he rose from the dead, and he was seen. And last night someone said, and he's coming back. Amen. I says, let me preach, okay? Let me do the job. You just sit there, all right? Okay, let me do it. But he is coming back. That's the message. That's the message that God uses through messy and magnificent people that change the world. That was a strategy back then, and that's the strategy that he uses today. And God says, I want you to be part of this movement. I'm too messy. No, you're not. No, you're not. There's someone standing in front of the line, the Apostle Paul, who changed the world. He'll do it. By that message, by that message right there, we'll change the world. And that's what we're called to do here in Northern Colorado, is take this message to people who desperately need it and let them know that Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And I'm asking you to be part of that magnificent movement and let's be bold about it. Let's all stand together. So how do we, how, how do we incorporate this? Three things, three things. Here it is, three things I want you to do. Here's what I want you to do. How do I make this practical? Three things, okay? Number one, every day, get up. You could do that. You could do that. Some days I'm tired of saying that, but get up, okay? Get up. My favorite, and, and even psychologically and emotionally, mentally, if you're down, one of my favorite verses is, though a righteous person falls seven times, so righteous people fall, though a righteous person falls seven times, yet he gets back up. So number one, you gotta get up. Number two, the first thing you do when you get up, number two, is look up. Say, God, help me receive what your child is supposed to receive today. When I get my kids up, when they were younger, I provided everything they needed for the day. Vicki and I, food, clothing. Number one, get up. Number two, what do you do? Look up. Number two, just look up. God, what, what do you have for me today? And number three, show up. Show up. Number one, what? Number two, number three, show up on Sunday. You show up on Sunday. What about tomorrow? Don't worry about tomorrow. 
when Monday comes, what you, you know what you have to do on Monday? No, what well, first thing you have to do on Monday is what? Yeah. Number two? Yeah. Number three? Yeah. But what about Tuesday? Oh, I got a presentation on Tuesday. Ah, shut up. Worry about Monday. Okay? When Tuesday comes, you? Yeah. Every day you show up. You show up. You show up that day. Why don't I show up? I'll tell you why I don't show up. Because sometimes I don't show up because my past bothers me, haunts me. I've made some terrible mistakes. I feel guilty. And I, feel, I feel full of shame. I'm guilty. Oh, oh well, God, ever you, oh, I'm so broken. Oh, I'm so screwed up. And, and the past, and, 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 and Hebrews 4, 16 says, go boldly to God's throne. Go boldly to God's throne, and he will give you mercy. You know what mercy does? It covers your past. God is merciful. People are not. People will remind you about your past and throw your mistakes in your face. God does not. God is merciful, so you can be delivered from your past. Are you all with me? You don't let your past rob you of your present. But I can't be present because I'm worried about the future. Oh, no, am I going to have enough money? Is my marriage going to make it? I don't know. I'm going to make it. And so sometimes the fear of the future robs me of the present. God says, come boldly to the throne, receive mercy for your past, and receive grace in time of need for you to face the future. God wants you to be present. Folks, in your marriage, your spouse wants you to be present. Your kids want you to be present. Your workplace wants you to be present. Your church, your family wants you to be present. Are you all with me? They want you to be present, to be alive, to be there in the moment. Oh, I can't. I'm too messed up. God's mercy is taking care of it. I'm too scared. God's grace takes care of it. So today, here's what I did today. Not feeling the best strength emotionally. A lot of stuff going on behind the scenes. A lot of stuff. Here's what I did this morning. Guess what I did? First thing I did. Guess what I did? Got up. Number two, I checked my clock to see if my clock was set forward. Okay, all right. Okay. But I did get up. Then number two, I... I'm going to be in front of a lot of people today, God, only by your grace. I don't know if I have the intelligence, the smarts, the emotional uh, acuity. I don't know if I have all of that to do this job. I really don't. So I need, to, I need you. So I got up. I looked up. And here I am. Here I am. Show that. That's, that's all we can do. That's all we can do. And God will do the rest. God will do the rest to his glory. Father, thank you that you've given us a system. And sometimes I don't like it. I take twists and turns I don't like in life. But I thank you that even in the midst of all the unknown, I got your grace. Oh, thank you, God. I am who I am by your grace. I got your promises I can stand on. And even if I mess up, even if I make a huge mistake, you're standing with me saying, take courage. Thank you for that. So today, Father, thank you for the gift of today. This week, help us every day to remember to get up, no matter how dark our world may be. Help us get up, help us look up, and help us show up. And do something extraordinary when we show up for your glory and our good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.